Welcome to our movie series. If you're not sure what's happening this morning, we aren't actually watching the whole film. We're speaking to bits and pieces of it. Uh, it's lovely to have you here this morning, especially if this is your first time. You are most welcome. Please enjoy the freebies. Enjoy the coffee in, in the cafe afterwards. Um, my name's Sandy. I and my family attend here at, at Kenmore Church. And believe it or not, movie analysis is part of my day job, albeit a very different context. I teach at English at a local all-boys high school. So I'm really hoping I don't have to send anyone to the office this morning. But if I did, Trish would absolutely sort you out. Don't you worry about that. So, one of the joys of my life as a high school English teacher is that I get to try and get 15-year-old boys to read and understand and maybe even appreciate Shakespeare. <laughs> you, you, you get my sarcasm, yes. It, truthfully, there's only one thing that beats the eye roll of a 15-year-old boy who's been told that he's learning Shakespeare, and that is the wounded groans of a 14-year-old boy who's been told he's studying poetry. Um, it's been the last six months of my life, so it's a little window uh, into my existence. But why do we still teach an English playwright from 400 years ago? The reason is that language may change, but fundamentally, humans do not. The reason Shakespeare's texts are so enduring is because we are still facing the same struggles, asking the same questions, and searching for the same answers as we were 400 years ago and even into ancient history. The tools at our disposal may have developed and the practicalities of that search have progressed, but the longings of humankind have not. And I believe that there is a scarlet thread stitched in the fabric of the universe that when exposed reveals God's themes and God's story, God's spell, the gospel. And that bright thread is exposed in humanity's art and storytelling, and the movie that I've chosen for this morning is no different. Admittedly, when my wife and I were walking through the foyer and we saw on one side Zelvin Botha, Top Gun Maverick, and on the other side, Liam Berry, Saving Private Ryan. And then in the middle was Sandy Bickerton, Frozen 2. <laughs> it did seem a bit out of place. But these are the things that we learn to embrace when we have small children. And I've seen this movie more times than I care to admit. But I actually kind of, kind of love it and, and have kind of embraced it. And, and it's at the point where whenever I take my boys on an excursion for school, I will ask my daughter if I can borrow her Elsa backpack. So I'm happy to walk around in public with, with that on show. So there is no embarrassment whatsoever from me for the selection of movie this morning, and I hope that you can appreciate that it is a good movie. I, uh, I don't expect that um, you would have seen it unless you've got kids of, of that age, um, but that's fine. If you haven't seen it, just a warning that there are significant spoilers this morning. Uh, I will ruin the whole plot for you, but uh, I mean, you've come to a movie series, so you knew what you were signing up for. So Frozen 2 is a story about uncovering the thread of truth and the journey of unraveling this scarlet thread. The protagonist, Elsa, and her close family and friends set off on a journey to reveal the mystery of the strange voice she keeps hearing and of the disturbance in nature which expels them from their kingdom. Eventually, they find a forest veiled in mist, and curiously, the mist is both representative of the truth Find the reason for the mist and you find the truth, while also being the very thing which conceals the truth. So, at the end of Frozen 1, everything is perfect. Elsa's finally figured out how to control her powers. And spoiler for the first movie, the answer is that love conquers fear. By the way, that's straight from the Bible, 1 John 4.18. You can look that up. But Elsa has all that she was after, and yet there is still this growing discontentment that there is something more to discover. I mean, she had everything. She had the career. She had the mansion. She had the loving friends and family. She had wealth. She had status, influence, power. I mean, literally, magical powers. And none of that could solve this voice inside of her that was saying there's something more to discover. None of those things could tell her why she existed. And let me ask you this morning, do you know your purpose in life? Do you know why you exist? 
Because all around us today, we see people searching for their purpose and meaning in, in these things. You know, if I just buy that next thing, or if I can just upgrade the size of my house or the size of my car, or if I can just achieve that next promotion, or if I can just make these grades, or if I can just get this next achievement in my video game, or if I can just buy Twitter, maybe that'll give purpose and meaning to my life. But the reality in our world is that the people who seem on the surface to have everything are actually the emptiest people inside. The further down that road you go, the more spectacularly you realize that those things can't give you meaning and purpose. They are insufficient. There is a deeper longing for truth and this strange, almost spiritual sense of being called out to discover that truth. So like most of us, Elsa sets out stubbornly on her own to pick up this scarlet thread. But one of the themes in the movie is that on our own, we aren't enough, but together we are stronger. And so her friends and family don't let her go alone. Despite being a smart, strong, and powerful person, she needs help to discover the truth. It's the same with our journey into truth. We can't do it on our own. We need help. And if you're here this morning and you think that you can discover truth on your own, then I would encourage you to listen to the words of the famous French reformer, John Calvin, who said, I'll, I'll paraphrase, he said, the smartest people in the, in the world have been disagreeing with each other from the beginning. What hope do we have? The smartest people in the world have been disagreeing with each other from the beginning. What hope do you and I have? You see, if discovering the truth was simply a matter of intellect, then surely you could just get everyone who has an IQ of 150 or above, put them in the same room, let them cook or do whatever they need to for a while, and then come out and go, what did you guys find? But it doesn't work like that. The smartest people in the world have been disagreeing with each other from the beginning. Our intellect is useful for discovering the truths of the, reali uh, the reality of the world around us, but in terms of discovering the ultimate truth of purpose and meaning, it is sadly but undeniably insufficient. We need help, just like Elsa, to find the truth. So the prompt to make this journey comes from within, almost as though it was planted there to spur on this journey. Like a farmer plants a seed, knowing that it will search out the soil and the sun, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has also set eternity into man's heart. And there is a deep part of us which longs to know and be known by the eternal, the spiritual. And we can see this in our world today. Whenever somebody looks for beauty in a painting or turns to poetry to express their emotion, or feels empathy for the suffering of somebody else, or wrestles with the grief of loss. Has anyone been to a funeral recently? You know, there's something undeniably spiritual about conf being confronted with the reality of death. Or what about when somebody advocates for the homeless or for the disabled? Those things have no argument in evolution whatsoever. It doesn't make sense from an evolutionary perspective. And yet, we know that it's right. Because in all of these things, there is an innate knowledge that you and I are more than flesh and blood, cells and atoms, meat and bone, toil and dust. You and I have a soul, and that soul longs to know and be known by the one who created it. And so there is this call from within, but there is also a voice a call from without. And initially, just like we can be, Elsa is in denial about this voice. She doesn't want to acknowledge that it is actually calling her because then ignoring it becomes a conscious decision. But deep down, each of us knows that there is something calling us forward, a spiritual reality to us. But what is that voice? Well, my question to you this morning is, why not God? It's incredible the links that people go to to simply deny the fact that God could even possibly exist. And, and when you really question people's belief systems, 
It's surprising the kind of things that they believe which they would not admit are on any par with belief in an all Uh, knowing God. Even just this week, I was having a conversation with one of my year nine students who admitted that morality had to have some kind of external existence. It was an external thing, some embodied reality or embodied presence. And yet, he would not go so far as to say that that could possibly be God. Why not? Why not God? You say, no, science is the voice that calls us forward. We desire truth inwardly, and so science and evolution call us forward outwardly. But science has no voice. There is an affection in the voice which science can't account for. Truth is more than discovering the reality of the world around us. It's about knowing who we are and where you belong in the universe. And that is not as a cosmic accident. It is as a being with purpose and value and meaning. Science is no voice. It's simply the echoes of our own searching cries returning to us from the dim landscape. There is truth in science, but it's not the truth of purpose and meaning. We aren't intrepid explorers on the path of truth. We are merely bats creating a picture in the dark. And still, there is a voice that calls us forward. Why not God? And you say, no, the the voice is morality. If I can't discover what is true, I will be led by what is good. But who told you what is good? How do you know what is good? And why does what you think is good differ so much from the person who lives in a different country, comes from a different background? See, an individual's sense of morality cannot be, unless it is guided by a higher principle and a higher power, it cannot be a beckoning voice. It is no more a voice calling us forward than a pair of sunglasses that we choose to wear, which filter the harsh rays of the sun and determine the hue of the world around us. Still, there is a voice which calls and longs to be known. So let me ask you this morning, has that still small voice been calling you? No matter how you reason or wrestle, there remains the ever-present whisper of being called to something greater. Revelation 3.23 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens up the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. The voice which is calling you is Jesus. Will you let him in this morning? Truth is found in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ, who said himself in John 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The outward call of Jesus is the answer to the inward call of truth. If you pick up that scarlet thread, you will see that it leads to Jesus. So in our movie, Elsa and her companions set off to pursue the voice and discover the truth. So the group make their journey, and then they discover this forest, which is shrouded in a mysterious mist. And in the film, the mist is used as a motif to symbolize both the consequences of rejecting the truth and the resulting blindness from the truth. And there are these two people groups trapped inside the mist, helpless as to where it came from or how to get rid of it. And in their shrouded existence, they turn to the one thing that they believe to be right, which is opposing each other. And the Bible uses this motif in a very similar way. We have an instance in Acts chapter 13 and verse 11, where a man is struck blind. And it says, you are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. So the motif is mist, and the theme is blindness. And and here's a little uh, English teacher lesson for you, right? There's a difference between a theme and a symbol and a motif. So a theme is like the the underlying big idea that gets talked about or or thought about or commented on, and a symbol is like something which is a thing, has a a picture, a a form, a, a thing, and it symbolizes something other than its literal meaning and identity. And then a motif is if a symbol is used repeatedly throughout a text to refer to a particular thing. So in addition to your free popcorn, you've also had a free English lesson. You're welcome this morning. 
So this, this motif is used numerous times throughout the Bible, but one of the most significant uh, uses of this idea of blindness is when it talks about people who have heard the message of Jesus but rejected. Initially, it's the Jews, but then it's broadened to anyone who hears Jesus' message and still rejects it. And we have a story in John chapter 12, verse 37 to 40, which says, Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe, because, as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. And so these people have been in the presence of Jesus. They've seen his ministry. They've seen him walking around and performing all of these incredible miracles, and still they refuse to put their faith in him. And the only explanation for that is that there is a spiritual blindness upon them which prevents them from seeing the truth. Though the scarlet thread be laid bare in their hands, they say, no, it's only a brown, loose end. And still there might be some people here this morning, I've heard this many times, who say, if only God would just show up and prove himself to me. If only he would speak to me and I would hear his voice. If only he could prove himself through some miraculous demonstration, then I would believe. But you know the problem with that is that 2,000 years ago, God did exactly that. God came to earth in the form of the man, Jesus Christ, and he revealed the character of God and the people didn't like that. And he told them that he was the son of God sent by God And they didn't like that. And he performed miracles in front of them that they had never seen before. And still, they didn't believe. You see, your your problem is not that you lack proof. The problem is that there is a spiritual blindness over everyone who does not believe. Because there is a mist that shrouds us. There is a mist which prevents us from seeing the truth. And that sentiment is itself a symptom of that mist. So where did this blindness come from? Well, our our movie's explanation isn't actually too far off. A royal act of violence and betrayal has resulted in a disturbance in nature and a corruption of the very natural order causes nature to turn against the descendants of this immoral king. And so these people are trapped in the mist, but they are also perpetrators of its consequence. They are victims of the mist, but by choice, they continue to hurt others. They are hurt by the mist, but they hurt others as a result. And the Bible says, even in a very similar way, that you and I live in a world of inherited brokenness, that long ago, our father Adam chose to rebel against God. And when he did, the very natural order was disrupted. This cosmic misdeed brought about a corruption of nature and of the moral character of Adam and all of his descendants. So long as humanity continues in rebellion against God and refusal to acknowledge who he is as the creator and savior of this world. And the word that the Bible uses for this cosmic misdeed is sin. And so you and I are born into and inherit this world of sin, but we also perpetuate it as a consequence. We are victims of the mist, but we are also perpetrators of its consequence. And so we inherit this world of sin, and yet the world of sin is inside us as well. World War I is no longer in living memory for us, but one of the results of that great war was that humanity gave up on the idea that we were heading towards utopia. Because in the early 20th century, there was this incredible positivity and optimism about humankind, just on the back of the the biggest leap in technological development that the world had ever seen in the Industrial Revolution. The the optimism and the, the positivity and the patriotism of the nationalist 
movement, independent governments forming and countries forming everywhere, the uh, nat- uh, gl- uh, globalism and people being, com- being connected and ideas being traded and humanity prospering and, and multiplying, there was this optimism in the early 20th century that if we just keep making progress, if we just keep inventing and if we just keep working hard, then we will create a perfect society. And then 14 million people die in a global war which involves all of the powers from every corner of the globe. And a few years later, the Spanish flu breaks out and 50 million more people die. It's like no matter what we do, we are somehow making the situation worse. And consider how advanced we are in our technology and and the internet these days, and yet it's being used to perpetrate horrific crime that people have never imagined before and to exploit the vulnerable. How connected we are through social media, and yet the rates of teenage depression continue their staggering climb almost as a direct result of that. There's war in Ukraine, there's rebellion in Iran, and if you believe the scientists, they're telling us that the the climate is changing and the world is dying around us, and it's our fault. It's almost as if the very natural world is raging against humanity, and that's a result of what we've inherited from our fathers, but also we continue, doesn't matter, even with our best efforts to solve that, we simply push the world further toward oblivion. We are victims of the mist, but we also perpetuate its consequence. And so humanity needs a solution that is bigger than us and more than anything that we can see. And as individuals, we need an answer that both saves us from this world and takes the corruption of this world out from us. We need the mist to be lifted And approaching today, that has been my one prayer, that God will lift the mist from your eyes this morning and allow you to see clearly his truth. Because removing the mist is something that only he can do. So what is the answer? How can the mist be lifted? How can we finally see what is the truth? And how can we escape the prison of this mist? Let's have a look. And so the symbol of this misdeed that was done by this king, this uh, trickery, this rebellion is the dam. And as long as the wall stands, then people are still victims of the mist and nature is still out of balance. And the truth that I pray God will allow you to see this morning is that the dam which holds back the blessing and peace of God is our sin. And in order for us to know his forgiveness and kindness and mercy, that wall needs to be destroyed. So who are we in this story? Because we love to place ourselves in the position of the protagonist who goes on the journey to solve the problem. But in reality, we are the people trapped in the mist, blinded by our situation, victims of circumstance and perpetuators of the consequence of that circumstance, desperate for somebody to come and to rescue us. Well, the book of Isaiah says in chapter 66 and verse 12, I will extend peace to her like a river and the wealth of nations like a flooding stream. And as well in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3 says, With joy you will draw from the springs of salvation. How do we access these waters? How do we joyously draw from the springs of salvation? Well, the wall of the dam must be destroyed. And the Bible tells us that we are not sufficient to destroy that wall ourselves. And just like Anna needed the strength of the giants to bring that wall down, you and I need a champion to fight for us who has the strength, who has the credentials to bring down that wall. And that champion is Jesus. And his victory is his cross. Because as Jesus endured the cross... He paid the price for sin for all humanity, for all time, and God accepted his payment. Three days later, he was resurrected from the grave to show that not only was his work as the mediating sacrifice of God complete, but he had overcome death and destroyed the grave. And on the day he died, the curtain in the temple was torn in two, symbolizing access to the mercy seat of God. 
So Jesus with his cross smashed that damn wall and now allows the rivers of God's peace to come flooding into our lives. And all God's ask of all God asks of us is that we believe in Jesus. And then these rivers of peace will come flowing into our hearts and we can drink joyously from the springs of salvation. Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave, has not only saved the world from sin, but has made a way for each of us to have the sin of the world removed from us. But it's not automatic. The wall for humanity has been broken down, but each of us has our own wall of resistance in our hearts. This wall symbolizes our rebellion against God and our refusal to acknowledge his rightful place as creator and savior of the world, and it holds back the forgiveness of God. Make no mistake, until you tear down the wall of your resistance to God, then the forgiveness available in the cross of Jesus Christ does not apply to you. That's where faith comes in. All God asks of us is that we believe in Jesus and in his cross, and then the rivers of God's peace come flowing into our hearts. Friends, I know it sounds crazy, but there's no other way. Christianity isn't about earning your way to forgiveness. It's about acknowledging that Jesus has already won your forgiveness. It's not about reforming your behavior in the hope that you are accepted by God. It is about accepting that Jesus' sacrifice is totally sufficient and allowing him to change your heart. The good works of Christianity come afterwards as a result of the rivers of life flowing through your once barren soul. So let me ask you this morning, have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you trust wholly and only in him? Because God won't accept a half commitment. There's no room for hedging your bets with Christianity while entertaining other roads to salvation. Half a faith in Christ is as good as no faith in Christ. You either believe that you are totally and utterly lost in the mist and that Jesus is your only hope or you reject him completely. There is no middle ground. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? I'd just like to invite the band back up and, and just invite everyone to just close your eyes at the moment as we reflect personally on this question. Do you trust Jesus wholly and entirely for the salvation of your soul? Perhaps you've been in church your whole life or part of your life, but you haven't allowed him to have full say. You've entertained Christianity as a safeguard against eternity, but you haven't given Jesus his rightful place at the center of your life. This morning, would you choose to make it different? Would you say to Jesus, nothing in my hands I bring, Simply to your cross I cling. Forsaking all other idols in my life, I choose to follow Jesus wholly and only and completely. And if that's you this morning, then just in this quiet moment of reflection, I just invite you to raise your hand. Don't be concerned about anyone seeing what really this is, is it's an acknowledgement to God that you want things to be different. Maybe something is only just making sense to you this morning or maybe you've realized that you thought that you'd teared, you've torn down that wall of resistance but there's still some of it there. There's part of you that still refuses to let God have his rightful place in your life. You want control or you want the say in where you go or what you do. But if you want to make it different this morning, then now's your opportunity to do so. Or maybe you're here this morning and you know deep down that the voice of God has been calling you into truth and you followed that scarlet thread and now for the first time you've realized that it leads to the cross of Jesus. Well, I urge you this morning, put your faith in Jesus Christ and in his cross because the moment you do, the wall of sin in your life 
is broken and the flood of God's mercy and forgiveness can flow in. But it doesn't happen automatically. You have to say to God, yes, I believe in Jesus and I want him to come into my life. Because being freed from the mist is not just about learning the truth. It's about the effects of the mist being removed from your life. And that requires you to invite Jesus into your heart. And if if that's you this morning, then just in this moment, while we were reflecting, while everyone's eyes are closed, would you just raise your hands? Not for man to see, but for God to know that you want to put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. And I just ask as everyone's eyes are closed and we reflect on our own position with Jesus, just in case there is work happening in someone's heart, then would you say this prayer after me, all of us together? Dear God, I put my faith in you this morning. I thank you that Jesus has torn down the wall of sin. And I trust that that work is sufficient for me. I accept the rivers of your life to come into me. And this morning I choose to follow you.